Good morning, everyone. Uh, I must say, this is such a romantic moment for me with, uh, I call that snow fluffy. I don't know what the Eskimos, you know, they have what, 20 words for snow? But it's so intimate and quiet with, uh, let's see, we got four, six, nine, 13, 15 there and two of us, 17 people here. It just feels so intimate and close. And I wish all of you out there in Zoom <laughs> could be with us today. But again, I like the fact that it feels intimate for me right now. And thank you, Stephanie, for your words. Uh, I'm reminded, <clears throat> if you pardon the diversion, but I'm reminded of Mark Bellatini, who uh, was a classmate of mine and he was the chair of the commission that created our hymnal. And uh, he was brought up Catholic in Detroit. Um, and he liked to say that uh, theologically, it was a Unitarian Universalist, Unitarian Universalist, boy, that's hard to say. Uh, but liturgically, he was still a Catholic, right? And they say you can take the Catholic out of the church, but you can't take the church out of the Catholic. And he created, when I was in seminary, this thing called a Braxis, which was um, a group of people who practiced liturgically Catholic rites and, you know, passages and that kind of thing, but with Unitarian Universalist theology. So um, anyway, so the reading today is from the Bible. Uh, and it's from Mark chapter 10, uh, the rich in the kingdom of God. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lacked, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So. Um, <laughs> well, last Sunday, our wonderful director of religious education and our administrator, Marion Eskamp, said to our congregation, the Unitarian Universalist Community Church of Southwest Michigan, said that we were small but mighty. And that made me think of an important person in our history who was also small and mighty, Thomas Stark King, uh, who's the namesake of my seminary, uh, Stark King School for the Ministry. You take it down. Stark King was born of a tailor who later became a universalist minister and taught uh, Stark King, Thomas, the very precept of universalism, which is God is love. And that we're all loved by God. And he imbued in Thomas the spirit that we should all love each other. Now again, I mentioned about him being small. 
And he said, I may weigh 120 pounds, but when I'm angry, I weigh a ton. Sadly, uh, when he was 15, this would be in 1839, his father died. And being the oldest in the family, he had to quit school and work to support his mother and his five younger siblings. So he never completed high school, let alone college. But he became self-taught. He had tutors, but he learned several languages. He learned theology, the German and French theologians, the transcendentalists like Ralph Waldo Emerson, William Ellery Channing, Theodore Parker. Uh, and later, when he was a minister in Boston, he had the reputation of being the most learned minister in Boston. In many ways, I see him as like another soft-taught American genius, Ben Franklin. <clears throat> at 18, he became a principal of a high school. And then at the age of 20, he took over his father's pulpit at the Universalist Church in Charles town massachusetts and after that he became the minister of the hollis street church in boston for 11 years during this time he would go to new hampshire to the white mountains um, and renew his spirit he actually wrote a book about his observations which was called white hills their landscape legends and poetry and some people consider this book more uh, poetic and perceptive of the natural world than, say, Henry David Thoreau's book, Walden. Then in time, in 1860, he was called to the Unitarian Church in San Francisco. Thus, he may truly be our first Unitarian Universalist, 100 years before our merger in 1961 when the Universalist Church of America merged with the American Unitarian Association, which now becomes the Unitarian Universalist Association. <clears throat> so uh, Thomas had a unique perspective of both the Unitarians and Universalists, and you can see by the quote what he, uh, what he thinks about them. You know, the universalists believe that God is too good to damn humanity, although he said man, but meaning humanity, while the Unitarians believe humanity is too good to be damned by God. And that pretty much sums up the two attitudes, the two ideas of these two denominations. And you think about our, our denomination, the Unitarians and Universalists, and we have seven principles. Uh, that were formed. And it took like uh, 14 years to form those principles. Um, and actually, it took longer than that. It took 23 years. I'm sorry. It was from 1961 to 1984. Um, anyway, the first principle is universalist. You all know the first principle? Affirming the worth and dignity of every person, right? That's universalist that we all have worth and dignity, that God loves us all. The Unitarian principle is the fourth one, which is a disciplined search for meaning and truth. In other words, using our powers of reason to discern what is true, what is right. And I feel so fortunate to be in this denomination that values both the heart and the mind, that we work these together to make a better world and a better life for ourselves. Well, I bring King's story to you today, uh, not to suggest that we take pride in him or in our denomination necessarily, although we could, but rather to hear it and reflect as a way of understanding ourselves. So he went to San Francisco and before he came to the pulpit in San Francisco, he stopped in Yosemite 
and uh, again to get spiritual renewal. He was so enthralled with Yosemite that he wrote many letters promoting it to be a state park and ultimately it became a state park and then later a national park. So he was the force behind making that a park uh, and making the idea of having parks in our nation. But what he is most known for is those four years that he was in the pulpit in San Francisco from 1860 to 1864, which of course was the greatest crisis time in our history, the Civil War. And he is given credit for saving California from being a free state. When he got there, there were slave owner Democrats that dominated the state. But he went far and wide in California. And as you know, it's a big state. And he preached, and he preached strongly. He had a deep resonant voice, strong voice. People saw him as a boy, but when they heard him talk, they were amazed. And he also made it possible for Lincoln to win California in the election in 1860, which was important because Lincoln won by 724 votes. So Lincoln actually said to Thomas Stark King, help save the union because God knows what would happen if California became a slave state. When he died, some 20,000 people came and Lincoln grieved. Now you may be wondering why am I telling you this snippet, this very small snippet of his story, since I'm supposed to be doing a stewardship sermon, raising money, that kind of thing. Well, I think it's important for us to really understand ourselves, to really understand what we believe, what is our vision, what is our mission, what do we want for this congregation? And history helps us to do that. Thomas Stark King reflects these values that we have today. And uh, he gives us sustenance, he gives us inspiration for us to really uh, be fire our imagination, if you will, about who we are. And we need to do that to really understand, to have clarity about our vision and our mission before we decide the money issue. We need to decide what do we want to do with our congregation? How do we want to be with each other? How do we want to take care with each other? What do we need in, in terms of professional leadership to do what we want to do? What about the children? What about social justice? And when we answer those questions, then we have a clear idea of what money we need to support our vision and our mission. So Star King can guide us with his heroic story and his commitment to the principles that we hold dear today. Now, this idea I'm trying to impart to you is, uh, is the idea that we need to think clearly first about what we are before we decide how much money we should spend. And to, uh, to demonstrate this idea, I'd like to tell you a story about when I graduated from Ohio State, the Ohio State University, and joined VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, become a VISTA worker in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I worked for a welfare rights organization, which was led by George Wiley, a compassionate, charismatic man who unfortunately died as a young man in a boating accident. And by the way, his daughter is Maya, Maya Wiley. Any of you know? She's an activist and a lawyer. She ran for mayor of New York last election. And she's a legal analyst in MSNBC. <clears throat> At any rate, uh, I was working, as I said, in welfare rights organization 
And we had a Vista house in the Manchester district, which you might consider the ghetto. There were six of us in this house. I remember one sunny day, I was sitting on the steps, just watching the comings and goings of the people there. And there was this group of young black men over to my left, just hanging out. And I saw this cop car come by and it stopped. Now I grew up in Chillicothe, Ohio, in a community that I never saw a cop come to our neighborhood ever, never. I was there from 1956 to 1964. I never saw a cop car. And I thought it was odd that this cop car decided to stop because people were so peaceful. It was a beautiful day. And the officers get out of the car and one officer goes to the black kids and says something, what are you doing there? I mean, I don't remember the exact conversation. Maybe he asked, are you selling drugs? I'm not sure. And he, he did it harshly. It wasn't polite. It wasn't respectful. And the kids say, hey, we're just hanging out. We're not causing any trouble. And he said, well, I want you to go. And the one kid said, hey, we have a right to stay here. He says, no, you don't. I say, you leave. And then the kid decided to stand his ground, which uh, I didn't think was wise, but I understood his frustration. But then the cop got more angry. And eventually he said, well, you're under arrest to this kid. For what? Public disturbance or something? I don't know. And the kid just got angry then. And so then the cop took him and slammed him against the cruiser hard and then handcuffed him and threw him into the car and drove away. I was shocked. I'd never seen anything like that ever. Now the other boys, they were casual about it. Apparently they've seen it many times, but I didn't. Now, as we well know, there's been controversy about policing in America, certainly in relationship to communities of color concerning racism, and there are problems, no doubt about it. In fact, uh, I just read in the Washington Post uh, yesterday, there was a study that showed that uh, localities were, uh, had to pay out $1.8 billion for police misbehavior, you know, legal suits, 1.8 billion. <clears throat> Now, uh, certainly after the murder of George Floyd and after killings of a number of particular black men, not just black men, there's been a call for this phrase, defund the police, defund the police. That's a problem for me, defund the police, that phrase. For one thing, it makes it seem like you want to defund the police. In other words, no funds at all, have no police force at all. And the vast majority of Americans would not want that, including the people that live in the community I was staying at in Pittsburgh. These people need the police more than many of us do because they're victims of crime. And black people have two complaints about the police. One is the racism, which I saw in Pittsburgh. I don't think the police would have done the same thing to young white boys, right, men. But the other is they feel like they don't get enough attention when there is crime. They don't feel like the police seem to care about their crimes. The police care more about when the wealthy or celebrities, you know, have a crime, then that becomes their focus. So defund the police, I think was an unfortunate phrase, but I understood what people were trying to say. They were saying that there, uh, there's a need for professionals to attend to those areas that police are not trained to handle. For example, mental illness or homelessness or domestic violence even, or uh, environmental degradation, uh, or the, just the 
general violence within the neighborhood. Uh, nutrition, food insecurity, truancy, educational problems. These are problems that police aren't really equipped to handle. And yet they are on the front lines. They're the ones that the people see when they have problems. It's a very difficult job being a police, police officer. Very difficult, very complex. It requires split second decisions that could shape a person's life forever. But then there's the other side of it, and I was disappointed actually to hear President Biden in his State of the Union address talk about funding the police, which is ironic because he was one of the creators of the crime bill in 1994 that actually ushered in mass incarceration in a bifurcated kind of legal system where it's been shown over and over again that black people are arrested more, are convicted more, have longer sentences than whites for the very same crimes. So really the problem is that they're talking about funding and defunding, funding, defunding. And they're talking about money, <laughs> you know, and they're talking about taxpayers' money. Was, was fraught with difficulty, especially given that our politicians really don't answer to the people so much, but to their donors. But that's not where we should begin. We should begin back to when I was in Pittsburgh witnessing this event. It was a small event. It wasn't a major event, I guess you might say, but still it was disturbing to me. And the question is, do we want that to happen again and again and again? That's what we should ask. And if we put more money into the police department in Pittsburgh, would that prevent that from happening? Or if we took money away, would that prevent it from happening? And actually, I think maybe we do need more money for the police. We need to have better trained police. I think they should have advanced degrees actually in, in social work, psychology, cultural studies, that kind of thing. And they should be screened carefully. They should be treated like professionals, like lawyers and doctors. I mean, we don't want, obviously, people that are prejudiced, but also we don't want people that are easily scared. Because as Robert Frost said, nobody scares me more than a frightened person. And it's the frightened cops who do the shooting without thinking because they're responding to their fear. <clears throat> so maybe we need to spend more. Or maybe we need to divert the money. I think we do. I think we need to divert money to other areas, but we also need to raise taxes, which is a moral issue and one that people don't like to talk about. And we need to create more uh, support for poor people. So this brings me to uh, my final story. And it's the idea that uh, talking about money is a sensitive issue, <laughs> right? Um, I was last a minister in South Bend, Indiana. One day an older black man came to visit me, a poor older black man, let's call him Jake. And he was asking for help. So I talked to him for a bit and then I gave him some money and I drove him to his place, a dilapidated building in the poor section of South Bend. Along the way, he was talking about how he wanted to start his own business doing landscaping or yard work or that kind of thing. I said, well, that's a good idea. I, I said, I could, maybe I could make some business cards for you. And then he asked about our religion. And I said, well, you know, it's kind of hard to describe our religion in so many words, but I did my best. And I said, well, I invite you come to our church service on Sunday. And then I looked at him and I said, Jake, if you do come, don't ask for money. Don't ask people for money. That would make them feel uncomfortable. So he did come to a Sunday service. And then I learned later that he broke his promise. He asked for money. And I guess that was upsetting to some people. But one of my members, Jim, who's a beekeeper, uh, did what I did. He gave him some money and drove him home, which was good, I thought, of Jim. 
later I saw Jake again and I said, Jake, you really disappoint me. I thought we had an agreement that you would not ask for money. You're welcome to come to our church, but I don't want you to do that again. Don't feel like I don't want you to come again. And so some Sunday later, he did come. And then after the church service, I was in the kitchen getting some co coffee and this younger man, uh, member, I was calling him Mac, came up to me and he was livid. He was really angry. He said, how could you let that man come here? He's asking for money again. How could you do that? You got to get rid of him. And then he walked away without listening to a word, what I had to say. And I had a couple of thoughts about that. One is, I think Matt had a hard time confronting an old black man. Our congregation was entirely white, except for a Japanese woman. Not much in the way of diversity. But the other thought I had was, um, you know, this idea of responsibility. Why is it my responsibility to attend to your discomfort? Why can you not talk to Jake yourself, express your feelings to him? And I thought, you know, you could have a conversation with him. You could listen to him. You can have compassion for him. And I don't think Matt had many conversations with older, poor black men. And I think in a lot of ways, his, um, his prejudice was more about his poverty than his race. There's a very deep prejudice against poor people in this country. And I give Ronald Reagan a lot of the blame for that when he talked about welfare queens. And he also defunded programs that help poor people. Um, and I know this personally from working in welfare rights. But think, how do we treat rich people? I think of Elon Musk, for example. Elon Musk, who is probably the greatest welfare recipient in America. He received billions, billions of dollars to play with rockets. He begged the government to give him money. And by God, they did. And our former president is begging people for money to buy a new airplane. And that doesn't seem to bother people. But when a poor person asks for money, then people feel uncomfortable. And I think a big part of it is the guilt, right? They feel like part of them feels like, well, they should, but they don't want to. And it affects their image of themselves as being kind and generous. And we're talking about money as a gift, right? We're talking about gifts that we give to each other. And money is certainly one of those gifts. But what is the greatest gift that we give to people? It's our time. Yeah. Our time. When we pay attention to people, when we listen without judgment, when we try to understand them, that is our greatest gift. That is what Matt could have done with Jake. He could have learned to be in relationship with him. And relationships, as we all know, can be difficult, complex. But when you make that commitment to them, you're showing your love. It's really simple, very simple. It's a gift to be simple. It's a gift to be free. It's a gift to come down where we ought to be.